Amen. Well, let me pray and dive into part two of our series. And I'm super, super excited. I believe the Lord has given me a word today uh, that's really not only going to help you with trusting the Lord with all your heart, but I think we're going to shatter some fear this morning. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that your promises are transformative. And as we open up this Bible, this incredible letter written to us, the very voice of God, speak to our hearts, God. Convict us, encourage us, stir us up, give us new perspective, fill us with prophetic vision. Lord, give us what you need that we can love you with all of our hearts. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, I'm gonna give you a second here to think of something. I want you to consider what you think is the most disobeyed verse in the entire Bible. The most disobeyed verse in the entire Bible. I'm sure many of you have thoughts going on and ideas. Now this has no theological study behind it, no scientific backing, it's just my holy hypothesis, but I believe that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 are the most disobeyed verses in the Bible. Many of us know it by memory, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. We know that verse, but somehow, some way, I think it's the most disobeyed verse for the simple reason that the greatest thing we can attain in life is to trust God with all of our hearts, to fully trust God. But at the same time, the greatest temptation we have is to lean on our own understanding. The greatest temptation we have is to lean on our own understanding. And that's why I believe that that verse is the most disobeyed. We say it, we agree with it, we declare it, we sing about it. But when push comes to shove, and sometimes the smallest little things, we are tempted to say, I'll figure this out and completely forget about the Lord. So today I wanna teach on the power of trusting God. The power of trusting God. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. And we're continuing our series called Fortify My Faith. I, I shared a message months ago on this, but the Lord just brought it back to my heart. And I feel so strongly that in the next couple of weeks, it's my job to help build your faith, to help us to walk in strong faith. Like Abraham in Romans chapter four, it says, without becoming weak in faith, Abraham contemplated his body. He did not waver in unbelief, but he held to the promise of God that what God had promised, he was able to perform. So to build strong faith. And I believe that if we're gonna build strong faith, the only way we can do that is chasing after the one thing. And so I looked in the Bible and, and I studied Psalm 27, the most famous and most powerful one thing. And that's where David says, the one thing I desire is to dwell in the house of the Lord, behold his beauty, meditate in his temple. That's the most powerful one thing. But in my time of study, I discovered that there's actually four different one things. And so today we're gonna look at the second one thing and it's about the one thing we lack. And I believe the one thing we could potentially lack in our faith and to build stronger faith is a complete surrender to trust the Lord. So we're going in Mark chapter 10. I hope you're there. We're gonna start in verse 17. And I'm reading now the New American Standard as always. Verse 17, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him, this is Jesus, and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's gonna be important later. And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth up. Looking at him, and look how incredible this is. In verse 21, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, one thing you lack. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. 
And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, and, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. They were even more astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Looking at them, Jesus said, with people it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. This is an incredible portion of scripture and this, this rich man seemed to have everything. And it looks like he worked really hard to get everything. He was rich, he had a lot of property, he was a good man. It says that he followed all the, the law, the, the Torah and, and, and what was told of him. He followed all of the rules and he built himself lots of investments. But he knew that one day, all of those investments would mean nothing because he's going to face death and you can't take your riches with you. So now he's looking at, well, what do I need to do to get to eternal life? How can I inherit eternal life? He went up to Jesus and said, okay, look, I've, I've done all the right things. I've done all the motions. I, I've done everything I needed to do on the outside. And Jesus says, with the love, because he knew that this man's heart was tied to his riches and not in a relationship with God. And he says, sell everything. What does it matter? And follow me. In the Greek, that word follow means come with me. Go in the same direction that I am going. I wonder if this was even a call to become a disciple and say, join me. Who cares about your riches? Let's build the kingdom of God together. And instead, this man said, mm, I love my stuff more and walked away grieved. Now, there's a, a bunch of ways you can interpret what he was grieved over or what Jesus said he was lacking, but I'm just gonna take some liberty in the scriptures here and say that what he was lacking was a strong trust in God. Why couldn't he trust Jesus' words that says, what I have for you is so much better than anything you can have in this world? But instead, he walked away sad and grieved, and ultimately, he did not accept, I can trust God. He wanted to work for it. Salvation is a free gift from the grace of God through faith. It's not something we can earn. It's only something that we can receive. So lack, in, in the Greek, in, in this scripture here, the word lack in the Greek means to fall behind or to come up short. So he fell behind, he came up short from fully trusting God. Remember when I was in middle school, uh, my teachers did the most horrific thing to students. Uh, they made us do physical education. I don't know if you've ever done this. It's horrible. I hate working out. I'm trying to learn to love it. And uh, we did physical education. It's a horrible thing when you have to sweat in the middle of your school day, especially sometimes they make you do it in your own clothes and not even, you know, PE uniform. But then they took it a step further and they did this demonic thing called the Roosevelt Middle School Olympics. And they made this thing a big deal. I'm telling you, family and friends, grandpas, grandmas came and sat in the stands and watched us. And I'm not good at sports. That's why I became a preacher. But my PE teacher thought the best thing we can make Rudy do in the Olympics is the one thing he is horrible at, running. So they put me in the mile relay with three other fast students. Now, if you know about the relay, you put the fastest person last to give you the best shot at winning. Where do you think this guy put me? Dead last. My three teammates were running so hard and so fast, they got a full lap ahead of everyone else. Then they passed me the baton. I'm not exaggerating, we came in dead last. Dead last. So to say I fell behind, I came up short, and that's what I believe that the Greek here is saying that no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you push it, you're still gonna come up short if you're doing it in your own understanding and not fully trusting God. If you're not fully committed, fully surrendered, as I said last week, great faith doesn't come from greater effort, it comes from greater surrender. If you're not fully surrendered to following God and trusting Him, what you're doing in your own efforts is vain. So I fell behind in the Olympics, but you know, just to encourage your hearts, the same year that I lost in the Olympics, I was actually the yo-yo champion of Roosevelt Middle School that year. So I guess the true message is stay in your own lane. That might be what I'm trying to communicate here. 
but I'm, I'm fascinated that we have studied the Bible for decades. We know how good God is. Every Sunday we come here to sing of his goodness. And yet time after time, we fall short and don't trust him. We trust ourselves. Now, when I look at the history of God and I look at my own history, who in their right mind would want to trust their self than God? But yet time after time, we simply gravitate towards leaning on our own understanding. It makes no sense. But all throughout the scriptures, we see it. Adam and Eve, they were promised. They, they walked with God in the cool of the day. They, they had unhurried and, and unrestricted fellowship with God. But the serpent said, God is holding back from you. And in a lie, he tried to make them sin to get what they already had in God. And they trusted in their own understanding more than the promise of God. Look, look at Abraham, who God said, you're going to be the father of many nations. But his wife was barren. And after 10 long years, rather than trust God and wait on the promise, they decided a better idea is to lean on our understanding and sleep with the maid and have a child through her. Uh, God would love that. No, it backfired horrifically. And in fact, Ishmael was the foundation of what is modern day Islam. And sometimes if we lead on, lean on our own understanding, the ramifications are horrible. We need to learn in our own way, and in the way God designed us to fully trust him. So I have one main point for us here. It's in your notes. And four words I want you to fill out. It says, what you fear determines what you worship. And what you worship determines what you trust. What you fear determines what you worship. And what you worship determines what you trust. We got to deal with fear. We have to deal with fear. I'm named Rudy after my grandpa, and he passed away just a couple of years ago. And I love my grandpa, and he was a, a sweet, sweet man. And you know it was genuine because he had seven daughters, six of which got into a lot of trouble. And the man still had a smile on his face. So that's good character. And my grandpa Rudy's favorite thing to do, favorite thing to do was nothing, nothing. He didn't have a front porch. So he would open his garage, set up a chair, sit on his driveway, look at nothing, say nothing and do nothing. And the older I get, the more fun that sounds. That sounds delightful. I sat, I sat with my grandpa many a times and we just sat down, you know, and just, <sighs> it's good. So he loved doing nothing. But unfortunately, I think that the main reason he loved doing nothing was because of anxiety and fear. His one flaw was that he was a terrified man. He retired, can you believe it or not? He retired at 53 years old. And he basically stayed in his house until he died in his mid 80s. He was terrified. He didn't like to go to the doctors. He didn't want to go out to lunch with us. He basically stayed in his room until the Lord took him home. Fear has a way of distracting us from the presence of God. Fear has a way of making our faith grow cold and we have to deal with it. And I believe the way we can deal with fear is by pulling apart the misconceptions about fear. So if you're taking notes, this is not in your bulletin. It won't be on the screen, but just a few thoughts here. The first is that fear is actually something you respect. Fear is something that you respect. It's more than just being emotionally afraid or scared or even terrorized. When you fear, you're actually respecting, honoring, and revering that thing. So when we talk about we need to fear God, we're not supposed to be afraid of him. What we are is to honor and revere and respect him. The problem is we can do that exact same thing we're supposed to do with God to so many other things. Last week I said, we need to stop being impressed by our problems and trials. It takes our breath away. We, we come into a, a problem and our first thought is, what are we gonna do? How is this gonna be possible? Rather than say, thank you God for your power. Thank you for who you are and honor him. So we combat fear with truth. We declare the hundreds of scriptures that talk about do not fear, and we live with a renewed mind. 
So fear is not just an emotion. Fear is something that you respect, that you are in awe of, that you are impressed by. The second thing is that fear can be a byproduct of sin. Fear could be a result of sin. Adam and Eve, they were told specifically what not to do. They did that exact thing that they weren't supposed to do. And immediately fear struck them and they hid from the presence of God. They covered their shame because of fear. So sometimes when we sin, it leads us to receiving a spirit of fear. Hebrews 12 tells us to toss aside every weight or encumbrance that so easily entangles us. Other scriptures say the sin which so easily entangles us. And I believe that Christians deal with so much unnecessary pain and struggle because we walk in fear and not in trust. We lean on our own understanding rather than on the truth of what God says. And I'm encouraged because sin is not something that you are gonna deal with all your life. You can master it. Genesis 4 tells us sin is crouching at your door, but you must master it. I heard one preacher say something that just pierced my heart. He said, if you believe that the only way you're going to be completely free from sin is when you die, then Jesus isn't your savior. Death is. You can be free today. You can walk in purity. Sin wants to crouch at your door, but you can master it. And the more you remove sin out of your life, the purer your heart is. And the Bible says the pure in heart will see God. There's greater intimacy when you free your heart of all the distraction, including sin. And the third thing about fear that we need to understand is fear is not an emotion. It's a spirit. 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So that means, according to this scripture, that there is such a thing as a spirit or a demon of fear. Boy, that's encouraging. And you know why it's encouraging? Because if fear is not an emotion, it's a demon, that means it must obey me. I have authority over a demon. I have complete authority over every devil. Emotion, I will wrestle with in my flesh, but a demon, go in the name of Jesus. So it is a spirit. And 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. You don't cast out an emotion. You cast out a devil. And perfect love produces the element of removing fear. So when you walk in God's love, the natural byproduct is that fear is gone. I mean, how can you fear when you're drunk in love? You remember when you first met your honey? You remember talking late into the night? You remember that it didn't matter. You had to go to work the next morning and work eight hours. It didn't matter how much money you spent. We'll find it somewhere else. You were drunk in love. How much more in the faith? You know, I, I talk about my puppies a whole lot, but you would too if you had perfect little angels. And last week I talked about my puppy that uh, my two-year-old schnauzer loves every human being and every dog on the planet. And my five-month-old schnauzer hates every dog and every human on the planet, except for me. And my niece spent the week with us this past week. Uh, she just took off to California yesterday. And it took a full five days of being in my house until my puppy would actually come up to her. Now, it's no secret that my puppy loves me. In fact, my puppy loves me more than anyone else in the whole family. I'm her favorite. And that's because I walk her, I feed her, I play with her, I snuggle her. She sleeps in my bed on me, okay? I love this dog. And I pay more attention to her than anyone else. She knows me. She knows me. So when someone who she doesn't know, a stranger to her, comes into my house, she is either on my lap, behind me, or in between my feet. She hides behind me because she trusts me because she knows me. If we want to walk in complete and full trust in the Lord with all of our hearts, it starts by knowing him. It starts by honestly knowing him. I mean, how can you trust somebody you don't know? How can you trust someone you don't have history with or who doesn't have a proven record of being good? We need to know him. And many of us can say, oh, I know God. Do we really? Is, is that something that is eternal in our hearts? that we want to constantly evolve and grow in our understanding of God. It's going to take an entire eternity 
to know who God is in heaven. So we could start right now and growing in our understanding. The more we know, the more we can trust. Psalm 46, verse 10 in the New American Standard, it says, cease striving and know that I am God. In the Hebrew, that word know is the word yada. And it's not yada, yada, yada. It's a powerful word. And that word yada, it means to know affectionately and intimately. In fact, that word yada is the same word in Hebrew used in Genesis 4 when Adam and Eve made a baby. The same word. It's intimacy. Be still, cease striving, and know that I am God. The more you know God, the easier it is to worship easier it is to walk into what we were designed to do, to spend unhurried fellowship with the Father, to meditate on his word, and to know him deeper. I think as I close here, I share this story every single Father's Day, uh, because as we shared many stories on our, our creative arts production, uh, our fathers can have a huge impact in our lives. I remember when I was in elementary school, living in California, we didn't worry about tornadoes there. We worried about earthquakes. And a Northridge earthquake hit near 7.0 magnitude. People were killed, gas lines burst, fires were everywhere, freeway bridges collapsed. And I remember waking up to this thunderous sound with picture frames falling off the wall and, and not knowing what was going on, having the fear that the roof was going to cave in on me. And before I could even finish my thought, my dad runs into the room completely picks me up and takes me along with the rest of the family outside. So if you don't remember in California, the North Ridge earthquake, there were aftershocks that were worse than the original. It's not similar. And so now I lived in this constant fear that at any moment, that same horrific thing that took people's lives could happen again to me. As a child, I didn't sleep for three days straight. And so my mom tried to comfort me as best moms can, you know, nice and sweetly and try to reassure me and try to speak logic to a child that doesn't care about logic. Then my six foot tall, gruff Mexican dad walks into my room on the third night, says, what are you scared of? <laughs> so much love. And uh, I said, the earthquakes. And all he had to do was say, who picked you up? Who took you out? I said, you did. He goes, I will die before I let anything bad happen to you. Went right to sleep, slept like a baby. And I share that as a, an example to prove to us that trust is not something we can inherit or earn or strive for like the rich young man tried to do. Trust is a byproduct of the intimacy we have with the Father. And if trust is a byproduct and is birth from intimacy, then you and I must do everything possible to remove every obstacle, every distraction, every sin that so entangles us so that we can run the race that is before us. Remove all the things that are in your hearts to love him more, to trust him more. Because when you fear, some horrible things can happen. But when you trust, you can see the power and love of God overflow in your life and in your families. So Father, on, on this day in which we honor our dads, we thank you for being the model, the picture, the perfect and pure example of how we are to live. You are holy. You are true. You are love. You are good. You are powerful. We can go on all day long and describe your attributes of being healer and creator, deliverer, comforter. But we thank you, God, as we depart from this place here today. We thank you that you have given us a hope and a future. You have saved our souls. We have all of eternity to spend with you. But here on this earth, we wrestle with the flesh. We wrestle with the enemy. We wrestle sometimes with ourselves. Would you, Holy Spirit, begin to work in our hearts to help us to renew our minds and give the right perspective to pursue truth, to pursue intimacy, to go after the one thing. We love you today, God. And as we go and celebrate our dads, may we go in your presence. May we go overflowing in your joy. And thank you that you are the one who walks alongside of us, comforts us, and protects us. Thank you for church. Thank you for this body of faith. Thank you so much, Lord, for this spiritual family. Let us enjoy this day only because of you. For we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.